to be water. All right, everyone. So I have four o'clock. Um, thank you so much for joining me. This is like my favorite time of the month, uh, just to present on something fun and maybe we can make this interactive. Can everybody see my slides? Okay. Okay, perfect. So I really wanted to talk about uh, what we should drink. I know a couple of months ago, we had a lecture on dangers of dehydration and what to do about that. But I really wanted to delve a little bit more into what we can drink. You know, should we just be drinking water? I mean, I have a lot of patients and clients that'll say to me, well, look, I drink coffee. Doesn't that count as a beverage? So I just wanted to go um, a little bit more specific on what we should be drinking how much we should be drinking. We're gonna do a little bit of a comparison to see what would be the actual best fluid that we can drink and how much we should drink. So just to recap um, a little bit about the dehydration issue, why talk about beverages at all? Well, definitely to prevent dehydration because I can tell you that this statistic, research shows that 75% of the American adult population is chronically dehydrated. And I so totally believe that because I would say, even more than that, my patients and clients are dehydrated. And that's just because, you know, some people, they just forget, you just forget to drink, you know, you're busy at work or busy, you know, out and about, you just forget to drink. Or I have some um, people that, you know, they have jobs where if they drink, then they have to go to the restroom and they can't do that, or they have restrictions, they can't leave their desks. Um, and then I have other patients and clients that just say to me, look, I just, you know, I just don't really like drinking, you know, I have my coffee in the morning, and then, you know, out of sight, out of mind. But that's really, really dangerous to our health, because certainly we live in a very hot climate. Um, we are more than 60% made of water. So we really need to have a lot of hydration. Um, symptoms of dehydration can be very subtle. And then all of a sudden it smashes you in the face and then you're really not feeling good. So you might have little or no urine or maybe your urine is really, really concentrated. And we notice that first thing in the morning, usually that's the most concentrated um, urine of the day. So you'll know that you're not dehydrated from the day before if your first urine is actually not that concentrated. And that's something that when I counsel my athletes, we have to really like down a lot of fluids, even the day before. And that actually helps your um, competitiveness the next day. And think about it at night when we're sleeping, our body is naturally condensing everything and concentrating everything. So you really dehydrate even sleeping. Um, you know, obviously if things that are supposed to be moist or dry, like if you have a dry mouth or throat or your eyes are really itchy and dry, or, you know, even when you, when you yawn, you don't, you don't even produce any tears, that is actually a sign of dehydration. Sleepiness or fatigue is actually a sign of dehydration, you know, and, and a lot of my, um, even my coworkers that I work with, usually around two or three o'clock, everybody's starting to yawn and we're looking for coffee and everybody's looking for that like caffeine rush. Meanwhile, I'm thinking, just have some water, have some, you know, beverage that can hydrate you and then you'll probably not be so tired. Um, also hunger, I didn't put that here, but even hunger, um, you feel hunger, but it's actually dehydration because the brain can't really distinguish between dehydration and hunger. So the feeling actually feels the same. Sometimes you get a headache, sometimes you feel lightheaded. Now dehydration is 
can be life threatening. I mean, I've seen a lot of patients go through my ER uh, because they just can't drink enough and they have to be placed on IV fluids and electrolytes and potassium. And it's, it's just a pain in the neck. So you have to be really careful. Uh, dehydration can lead to kidney failure and heart, heart issues and seizures. Um, and then even on this side, having urinary tract infections, if you're one that gets that frequently, you have to think about, well, how much are you actually drinking? Same thing with kidney stones too. If you have history of kidney stones, you really, really need those, keep those kidneys healthy. I know we had that lecture last month, um, but really hydration is what keeps our kidneys healthy. All right, so I wanted to introduce this to you because I thought it was pretty cool. Did you know that the United States actually formed a six panel independent beverage guidance panel <laughs> to review the evidence on beverages and health? And it was pretty cool because I think uh, Harvard actually headed this, this uh, panel. And what they did was they ranked different beverages into levels. Um, based on how many calories they might have or the contribution to um, the calorie intake, what kind of essential nutrients, maybe if it had any, and if it had any evidence for positive or negative effects on the health. And I really love this guide. So then when my patient says to me, well, I'm a coffee drinker, doesn't that count as a beverage? I actually have the evidence to say, well, actually it does count as a beverage, but, <laughs> and then I can go into it a little bit more. So this is just a really nice picture, and this is what we're going to go through um, right now. So I'm not going to dwell on this right now because I want to go through each category. So of course, level one, which is the best level, um, water is the winner. So according to this panel, they're saying that water is the best. And the Institute of Medicine has set up an adequate intake of 125 ounces. That's 15 cups for men and 91 ounces for women cups. That's a lot. That's not easy to do. Certainly if you're on the golf course or the tennis court, tennis um, course um, uh, level there and you're, you're playing tennis and you're sweating and then you're drinking and then you're sweating and then you're drinking, then before you know it, you're drinking 11 cups. But on a typical day, you're hanging out, you maybe you're doing some house cleaning, you know, maybe you're going outside a little bit. Ah, 11 cups. Wow. So why is water so important? Think about physiology always, right? When you look at the body, we have, we're made of a lot of water, okay? So adult men greater than 60% water and adult women greater than 55%. And when you look at the different organs and the organ systems of the body, they require a lot of water to function and they actually hold a lot of water as well. So if you're not drinking enough water, these organs are going to suffer. What does water actually do for us in these organs, though? You know, it does form digest. I mean, think about all the fluids in your body, everything, right? Stomach acids, urine, uh, synovial fluid. That, that means the fluid in between your joints, cerebrospinal fluid, um, your mucous membranes. I mean, anything that, that is wet and moist obviously needs water. Um, it also flushes out all those toxins that we talked about. It lubricates your joints. Water actually helps to regulate your body temperature, and that's really important too. And that's why I do have some patients that have heart conditions and kidney conditions. And sometimes this really hot, humid weather is really dangerous for them because you know they, they can't get enough fluid to balance that body temperature. Um, also, water is actually needed not just for the digestive process, but also for losing weight. <laughs> Believe it or not, there was a study that showed people that drink plenty of water, their, their recommended amount of water while they're dieting actually did better than those people that were dehydrated and dieting. So how cool is that? And it kind of makes sense when you're dieting, you're losing, you know, body fat, and you've got all these metabolites in your body that really have to flush out. Um, oxygen also helps the cardiovascular system, right? And the cardiovascular system is so important because that's what circulates all the blood, the oxygen, the nutrients. So, you know, you don't want a dried out cardiovascular system, that's for sure. Now, I like this chart a little bit better than what the um, Institute of Medicine was talking about, just because this makes things more realistic. And I look at how much water or fluid should you be drinking per day, and it's based on your body weight. And that, to me, just makes more sense, whether you are a male or a female. Um, you know, if you're a 300-pound female, you 
or a 300 pound male, you need 120 ounces of fluid a day, which again is a, is a lot of fluid, um, but it would make sense because you have a much higher body composition, right? So this is really what I look for to give guidance to my patients. I look at their weight and then try to make it realistic. So you know, that's why in general, we might say eight cups a day or, or a gallon a day, but you know, looking at your weight gives you a better predictor. And it makes it more doable, you know, to tell somebody that's 120 pounds, okay, go drink 11 cups of water. What? <laughs> that's just a lot. So, you know, maybe four cups is adequate enough for physiological health. So just to make things confusing, though, not all water is created equal. So I wanted to go through all the different types of water so we have a better understanding. And should we pick one over the other? So we've got tap water. We've got purified water. We've got distilled or ionized water, which is actually part of the category of purified water. Then we've got electrolyte water. And under that, we've got alkaline water, or we have mineral water, we've got spring water, and then of course we've got sparkling water. <laughs> so there are lots of different types of water. So let's just go through them. All right, so tap water, that's pretty obvious, right? That comes out of the faucet. So um, depending upon where you live might dictate what percentage of these chemicals that they put in to disinfect the, the water. I remember when I lived in plantation, um, every so often we would get something in the mail, a letter saying, you know, that they're going to be increasing the chlorine in the water. And oh my gosh, you could smell it. I almost felt like I was drinking pool water. Seriously, it was so strong sometimes. I was like, oh, I don't know if I really want that in my body. Um, there are other chemicals that they put in it to neutralize dirt and things like that. And some counties actually still uh, put fluoride in their water. And there are definitely pros and cons to that. I think the pro to the tap water is, well, it's relatively inexpensive. I mean, I know we still have to pay our water bill, um, but compared to maybe buying cases of water, comparably it's inexpensive. The fluoride in the water was added to help to reduce tooth decay. So that was actually a pro. And when you look, you know, some dentists are very happy about that. Um, there might be less pollution produced because now you're drinking out of the tap, you're using your own containers. So we're not, you know, adding to the landfill with the bottles and the plastics and the cans and the straws and all of that stuff. The cons though, is that these chemical contaminants, number one, they don't taste so good. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I don't want to drink pool water. And there is some question about fluoride, maybe, and sorry, there's a typo there, maybe linked to cancer. Um, and also just think about it, uh, things that are regulated, well, there's always seems to be a breakdown sometimes in these regulations, right? <laughs> and probably the example of that would be think Flint, Michigan, when they had all that lead and contaminant in that water supply that those poor people were drinking. So that's why a lot of people are still kind of uh, weird about drinking their tap water. I remember when I lived in New York, I remember, uh, you know, we New Yorkers were saying, we've got the best tap water. <laughs> and a lot of people would just drink out of their tap and it wasn't a big deal. But now people are being a little bit more self-conscious about it because of the chemicals that are put into the water. So that's why we've moved on to buying our water. And when you go down the Publix aisle, you see that whole aisle of water and you've got those jugs of purified water. And sometimes the purified water is called drinking water. So I know when you go down the Publix by me, they've got two types of water. They've got drinking water. So they don't call it purified. They call it drinking water. And then they have the spring water. So the purified water is water that has been filtered or processed to remove impurities like chemicals and other contaminants. So basically it's tap water that's been further filtered um, to remove some of these chemicals and contaminants. So these are just some examples of some brands. Now, of course, you can make your own purified water. So if you, you know, don't really want to go out and buy those cases of water because they're darn heavy too, um, you can have your own home filtration system. Some of them get very, very intricate um, and they get very expensive as well. And there are different um, ways that you can actually purify your water. You can do it through a filtration process and the filtration might have different kinds of either filters or charcoal filters, 
or filters that almost look like paper to, you know, kind of like almost like a mask, right? And they can, um, they have different size pores and they will let certain sizes go through and not go through. And then you've got reverse osmosis, which actually uses a semi-permeable membrane filter. And then you've got the UV lights. This is kind of a neat system. Um, it can get pretty expensive though, uh, but the UV light is to really disinfect the harmful pathogens in the water. It doesn't really take out any of the chemicals though. And I remember when I was um, took my trip to India, I actually had a little handheld UV light, which was really cool. Um, because even though I did drink bottled water there, I still used my UV light just to make sure. So what are some of the pros? The pros of purified water is that um, you know, it's filtered to remove most of the bacteria, algae, fungi, parasites. Remember, it's not sterile. The minute you open that bottle, it's not sterile anymore. Um, and it does also remove some, some things like copper and lead and some chemical pollutants. I think it tastes good, you know, for the most part. Um, and it's non-chlorinated. And I kind of like that because there's questions about chlorine and the health. The problem though, is that it can get relatively expensive. If you're buying cases and cases of water, it gets expensive, um, definitely contributes to the pollution of the earth. Um, that's not fun. Um, just one tip that um, a person working in recycle told me that when you throw out your plastic bottle, take off the cap and crush the bottle. If you keep the cap on the bottle, that bottle will actually disintegrate so much slower. And I'm talking about years and years and years slower. So take off the cap, throw that out separately and then crush it. And that'll actually help it to break down a lot quicker. Um, there's potential cross-contamination. And I put that there because I don't know how many people of my patients and clients, they like to reuse their bottles. Um, and that's really not recommended because those bottles, you know, you can't wash them properly. If you put them in the microwave, then they have this weird residue on it. So you really can't disinfect it all that well. And if you're putting, you know, other water or other things in there, you could be cross-contaminating. So be careful about that. These are just a couple of pictures of the filtration systems. I know that this is just one company. They've really expanded their product line. I do have a lot of people that use this system. And then you've got others that you can get installed directly onto your tap, which again, that gets kind of pricey. I live out here in Southwest Ranches, so I actually have well water. So I have no choice. <laughs> I have to have a system like this. Otherwise, my toilets will turn orange because there's so much iron in the well water out here. And this is just the UV light. I wanted to show you the one that I used when I went to India. It was just this little handheld one. And I don't know, the doctors around me probably thought I was a weirdo, but I didn't care. Every time we opened up bottled water, I'd put my little UV light in there for about 20 seconds and I just felt a little bit better about that. So those are the UV lights. Now, another category of purified water would be distilled or ionized water. So what's really neat about distilled water is that it's actually considered one of the purest forms of water because it's actually the steam from the boiling water that's been cooled and then returned back to the liquid state. So it's like a chemistry project here. Um, so you can actually make your own distilled water. I mean, certainly there are machines that can do that, but again, that gets pricey. So if you fill up a large pot of water about halfway and then tie a cup to the pot's lid, I know you're all going to do this as a home project, right? Um, and then what happens is that water that kind of um, evaporates will actually go into the cup. Um, try not to touch it though, because then you're going to contaminate it. But all those water drops, that is actually distilled water. Now, the pro is, of course, it's one of the purest forms of water that, you know, you're really breaking it down molecularly and then collecting the components again. So it's really very, very pure. Um, it takes out all the dissolved minerals and things like that. But I think one of the biggest cons to distilled water is that it tastes crummy. Uh, it's definitely, it tastes weird. It, it almost doesn't taste like water. I don't know. It, it tastes kind of weird. And that's to me, it's very boring. It's very flat. Um, the other thing is 
it doesn't have any of the dissolved minerals, not just for taste, but also for health. So it doesn't have any of the electrolytes. And we're going to talk about electrolytes in a second, but electrolytes are important because if you don't have them, you know, you could become fatigued. You can actually have um, muscle problems, you know, contraction problems. And that means of your heart as well. You can get numbness and tingling, confusion, muscle weakness. So we actually do need the electrolytes. Um, and it's said to be a poor hydrator. So even though it's water, it's a poor hydrator because you actually need the electrolytes to attract the water. It's wild. It's all about biochemistry. So it's, you know, you're drinking this wet water and it's not even hydrating you. So I really um, reserve my distilled water to my coffee pot <laughs> because, uh, you know, you don't want to get that weird, you know, mineral wing ring in your coffee pot. So I use that or my fish tank, things like that. But I personally don't drink distilled water, plus the fact that I don't like the taste of it. Now, electrolyte water goes by many different names. Sometimes it's called mineral water, sometimes it's called alkaline water, or sometimes it's called spring water. And it's called all of those names because it has the electrolytes in them. So what exactly are the electrolytes? The electrolytes are sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, even chloride, which I didn't even put here. And adding these electrolytes actually changes the pH of that water. Um, tap water is a little acidic. I know that sounds kind of weird. It's not acidy like orange juice, but if you were to put a pH thermometer in there, it would read a little bit um, less than seven. Seven is neutral. So when you're doing an electrolyte water, you're actually going above the seven. And the EPA guidelines state that tap water should be between 6.5 and 8.5, but it all depends on where you live and what kind of chemicals they're putting in. If they're putting in chlorine and they're putting in fluoride, it tends to be a little bit more acidic. Now, the, the pro, I think, of the electrolyte water is it tastes good. It just needs to have that little bit of, you know, I wouldn't call it salty, but almost like that. Mm, that bolder taste. Um, and it does contain health benefits because those electrolytes, what are they used for? Sodium and potassium are so important to uh, muscle contraction and nerve transmission. You actually need electrolytes. Calcium and phosphorus, of course, for your bones. It is a very good hydrator. So if you are dehydrated, go grab some electrolyte water. And it does prevent dehydration and uh, heat stroke, especially when you're losing fluids just because um, it's able to hydrate you better. But this is interesting. And this is something that I always try to recommend to my patients too, especially the ones that are on medications for high blood pressure. You have to remember that electrolytes, part of that is sodium. So if you are being treated for high blood pressure and are on medication for blood pressure issues, be careful about how much electrolyte water you're drinking, because that's adding to the sodium content of your diet. Um, people with high blood pressure should only be drinking or, or eating about 1500 milligrams of sodium per day. So if you're drinking a lot of water with sodium in it, that does contribute it to it. The also the other thing too is I have some patients that have to take potassium pills. Um, maybe they're taking a diuretic and certain diuretics, um, doctors have to prescribe potassium because those diuretics get rid of potassium. But think about it. If you're taking a potassium pill and you're drinking electrolyte water, you're also adding to the potassium content of your diet. So be careful with that too. You don't want to start getting arrhythmias because of your darn water. Um, also use caution if you have kidney disease. People that have chronic kidney disease just have a harder time balancing a lot of these electrolytes. So I don't generally recommend electrolyte water as an everyday drinkable fluid for people that have kidney disease. I'd rather just do just a purified water for them. This is just a chart just to show you just um, what these electrolytes are and kind of the things that they do in the body, but we already kind of talked about that. And these are just some examples. There are so many out there. So if you buy like a natural spring water, or if you buy ones that have been processed to include electrolytes in them to make them more alkaline, kind of like the smart water in this one. So all different kinds. 
And then you've got the sports drinks. Now the sports drinks and the Pedialyte, these are electrolyte waters as well. And they're usually adding some sort of sugar to it or glucose or sugar substitute. Um, so these can also be used to replace uh, electrolyte water. But remember, if you're adding the ones with sugar or glucose, you're adding calories. And then if you're adding the ones that are zero calorie, you're adding sugar substitutes. So I don't know what your philosophy is about that. This is one way that you can actually make your own sports drink. And this is kind of cool, you know, if you like cooking and doing different things. So you just take your own water, maybe some purified water. You add a teaspoon of salt, a teaspoon of baking soda, and then you can add potassium in the form of Mrs. Dash. And then just mix it all up with some sort of flavoring like a water enhancer or a crystal light. And then you can make your own, you know, homemade Gatorade. <laughs> Of course, these strategies are always fun too to increase water intake, just infusing your water. And I, and I see now that a lot of um, places in the deli area, they make like homemade infused water. It's pretty neat. I had one the other day, I think it had basil, mint, lemon, uh, had something else in it that I just can't remember, but it was really, really good, but it was expensive. It was this little tiny thing for two bucks. It was a lot of money. So I'd rather just make my own. This is just a recipe. I think I sent this to you guys once before, but you know, you can just have fun with it. The only thing you just have to remember is if you make your own infused water, it's really not sterile. Remember when you're putting herbs and things like that, you've really got to wash those herbs, make sure there's no dirt on them um, because botulism lives in the dirt <laughs> and you don't want any botulism spores in your infused water. And if you just want to be on the safe side, just go get a commercial brand. This, this hint is very popular. And then you've got the water enhancers. I have some of my patients and clients just say to me, look, I just don't drink water. It's just boring. Whether it's electrolyte water or purified water or spring water, it's just not my thing. Okay, well, then maybe doing some of what we call water enhancers. But let's just take a look at what these are. These water enhancers really are garbage. I'm uh, just being honest about it. All it is is a bunch of food dye and sugars or sugar substitutes and artificial flavors, you know, so it's got peach flavor or, you know, fruit punch flavor. So they're kind of, you know, they're really not uh, nutritionally balanced. But then I look on the flip side and I say to myself, okay, so if my patient is having a hard time drinking, and this is the only way that they can really get their fluid in, then do it. Because the flip side of not doing it would be they'd get dehydrated and they'd get sick. So when you go to the supermarket now, my goodness, there are so many different types of water enhancers that are out there. And these are very cool just because they're already diluted. So it's not like you get the powder and now you got to mix it and mix it and mix it. And of course, the powder that gets stuck on the bottom. It's such a pain in the neck. So these are kind of cool. And it's, it's really convenient for a lot of people. But you know, I'll just be honest with you from a nutrition standpoint, they're kind of junky. But if it allows you to drink more water, then I guess it's suiting its purpose. Now, last but not least for the water, um, there's sparkling water. And sparkling water is carbonated. And as you know, carbonation is a CO2 gas. You can make your own sparkling water because now they sell those carbonated, you know, machines that maybe you got for Christmas. And all it does is put that carbon dioxide into that product. Now, definitely pros and cons. You know, some people really, really like those bubbles. They like it. They just like the, the way it feels in the mouth. It just, you know, it settles their stomach. They just really like it. Um, it also contains electrolytes, so that's good. And some of the sparkling water, depends on the brand, some of them will contain sugar or they're sugar-free. Or sometimes they just have no flavor. But the cons are, again, it, it is expensive. You know, it is a product that you have to go and buy. And I'm always very careful with my patients and clients that have reflux, which is also called GERD or heartburn or gastritis. Carbonation in general is just not the best product for somebody that has stomach issues like that. And the reason for that is the carbon dioxide 
actually has to convert into something called carbonic acid. Your body doesn't really like carbon dioxide. That's why we breathe it out. Okay, we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out CO2. But now if you're drinking CO2 and putting it into your body, your body's got to get rid of it somehow. And the way it does that is maybe you get a little gassy, you get a little burpy, or the other way is it converts it to an acid. So that's why I always tell my patients, you know, if you have GERD, if you have heartburn, if you have reflux, get rid of the carbonation. The other thing that carbonation does, it actually keeps the valve open. You have, a, you have two valves, one valve at the end of your esophagus that enters your stomach, and then you've got another valve that leaves your stomach into your intestines. And when you drink carbonation, it keeps the upper valve open. And that's why you can get that reflux, uh, reflux. you get that heartburn because everything's regurgitating back up. The other um, theory is does carbonated water or sparkling water actually lead to weight gain? So some of my patients, and as you know, I work with a clientele that have a lot of weight. And what's interesting is there seems to be a correlation between carbonation and how much they're able to eat. And it almost makes sense because if you're putting gas into your stomach and stretching it, because that's what it does, it causes pressure against your stomach wall, you're theoretically going to be able to eat more because now you just you know, push that stomach out. That's why when you had that indigestion, that agita, who would tell you, go have some carbonation, go have some ginger ale. Okay, it wasn't the ginger in the ginger ale because there's no ginger in ginger ale. That's all artificial stuff. It was the bubbles. The bubbles would actually stretch that stomach a little to give you that relief if you overate. So think about that. If you know you don't have indigestion, but you're putting that into your stomach, could you theoretically be eating more? And I can tell you just from my experience and looking at food diaries for a living, I can tell you that my patients that drink carbonation actually eat more calories. And the other thing too is remember sparkling water isn't calorie free, depends on which product you're buying. So do you really wanna add calories through your beverages? Always a question you need to ask yourself, especially if you're trying to lose weight. All right, so that's level one. Level one is water. So everybody's saying that is the best. At least we have some choices when it comes to water, okay? But level two is tea and coffee. So I was happy about that because actually tea and coffee is the most commonly consumed beverages globally. We love our tea and we love our coffee. But here's the problem. If we're not drinking black coffee or maybe, you know, coffee with just a little bit of milk, just a little splash of milk or a creamer. If we're actually drinking those dessert coffees with lots of cream and lots of sugar and lots of milk and lots of flavoring, those are more desserts. <laughs> that's like a liquid dessert. And in that case, that's not a level two. So when the uh, panel said tea and coffee, they were really talking about, you know, black tea and coffee or very minimally added to. So some of the benefits, coffee and tea, we know there are health benefits, right? They're both antioxidants. Some of them may or may not contain caffeine. Um, there has been some study, which is really interesting, that both coffee and tea can reduce the risk of certain conditions like diabetes and heart disease and Alzheimer's. So that's pretty neat and even protects the liver. Um, it's just when too much. I think too much in this study, I think they were saying that eight cups of coffee a day still conferred health benefit. But if you go over that, then it could actually cause a problem, especially if it's caffeinated. So how much caffeine per day is okay? Well, the health benefits um, describe that moderate amounts of caffeine is still okay. But look at this definition. Excessive caffeine is actually defined as anything greater than 400 milligrams of caffeine. And I got to tell you, when you look at some of these drinks, they contain a lot of coffee, a lot of caffeine. Like, look at this Starbucks coffee, a 20 ounce. There you go. You just met your needs for the day. <laughs> so that's it. And believe me, I have colleagues that go through tons of this per day. So they're really boning up on their caffeine. So what's really neat about um, things like this is this is all accessible to the public. If you ever wanted to know, you know, how much caffeine is in a Dunkin' Donut coffee, they really have to supply that information so you can actually look it up. 
teas generally do have less caffeine in them. That is true, but they still contain some. Like look at this one, the Starbucks Tazo Awake Brew Tea, 135 milligrams. Okay, so that's still high in there, right? So, you know, just be aware that caffeine be healthful unless we drink too much of it. And I had a patient that actually asked me today, um, she's going in for surgery. And one of the requirements is not to have caffeine for a couple of months after surgery. So she's like, well, why? And that was a really good question. So she's getting surgery on her stomach, where we're actually going to be taking away part of her stomach. So when you drink caffeine, caffeine is a gastric irritant, it actually causes the stomach to eat acid. So again, that would be something that I would recommend to patients that suffer from reflux or GERD or heartburn. You really got to watch that caffeine, really decrease it. It's also a diuretic too. So if you're really not drinking all that much, especially not drinking water, but you're boning up on all this caffeine and then you're urinating, you're dehydrating yourself. Again, these are just some other labels on caffeine. And don't forget some of the over-the-counter pills also contain caffeine. Now I love tea, I guess that's my Asian and British side. And there are all different types of tea. We've got white tea, we've got black tea, we've got green tea, and then we've got herbal tea. And the category of herbal tea is just, woo, lots of different herbal teas. White tea is really nice if you like something that's not so strong in the tea. It's very mild. It doesn't have that robust um, vigor. So it's pretty mild um, and it does contain fluoride. So think about that. You're drinking tea that's a product that has a natural fluoride in it rather than an added fluoride. So this is actually good for your teeth. It also has something called catechins and tannins. Um, actually helps to fight plaque. How cool is that? Um, and it actually makes you more resistant to different acids and sugar on your teeth. And it has, out of all the teas, the least amount of caffeine. So, except herbal teas, I'm talking about like the black teas and the white teas. So it's got about 15 to 39 milligrams per cup, depends on the brand. And it looks so pretty. It looks kind of pale, but it looks pretty. Then we've got black tea and black tea is made from the same tea leaves as white tea, but these uh, tea leaves are actually dried and fermented. And by doing that, you're going to give it that richer flavor, that bolder color. Um, orange pico and oolong is actually a type of black tea, but it's weird because oolong can also be considered a type of green tea if it's not oxidized. It's, it's kind of confusing. Now, what's really nice about black tea is if you really like that bold flavor, that robust flavor, then go for the black tea. Um, and depending upon how long you steep it, it might be stronger, but it does have those tannins. So sometimes it can get a little bit bitter. Um, black tea is high in antioxidants. So what are antioxidants? Those are things that actually protect your cells from being destroyed by free radicals, which are produced naturally by metabolism. Um, and, you know, free radicals aren't good for our cells because it destroys them. And if you destroy your cell, that means you have to reproduce it. And if you keep damaging it and they have to keep reproducing, eventually it might become mutated. And that mutation is called cancer. So that's why antioxidants are really good for us. Whenever we can get them, we should eat them and drink them. Um, can be used for other purposes. Oh, look at this. So black tea can actually also be used as different salves if you have like sunburn or if you have scrapes and uh, poison ivy or, you know, some sort of rash, you can actually use that as a salve. Um, and remember, it does have some caffeine. So it's going to go a little bit higher in the caffeine. Now, green tea happens to be one of my favorites, probably because on my Asian side, but also because I know about all the different health benefits. And I wanted to just show you this. This is called matcha. So you've got green tea that looks like tea. So it's clear. You look at it, it's green and it's clear. But then you've got matcha that when you make it, it looks kind of, it looks like sludge. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. It doesn't have the best, um, you know, visual um, appetite there. Yeah, and it's like, oh my gosh, it looks like algae that's floating on a pond. It's very thick, but I have to tell you, it is so good for you. It's actually green. It's, it's the tea leaves that are crushed. 
So you are getting such a concentration of those antioxidants and those vitamins and those minerals. It is very astringent though, it, it's strong. Um, so you might wanna think of maybe, I know, diluting it, or maybe you can add a little bit of milk to temper that, that robustness a little bit, or making it cold and putting ice. It's just so healthy for you. Um, it does come in a powder like this. Sometimes you can get it in tea bags but it does, I get the authentic powder and you have to play around with it to see how much sludge <laughs> you actually wanna make because the more, believe me, it goes a long way. I think I use half a teaspoon for a whole mug. So you really have to kind of play around with it, but it is so tasty, it is so good for you. So green tea, the pros, like we said, definitely a powerful antioxidant and it's also an anti-inflammatory. And that's really important because when you look at different chronic diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, arthritis, lupus, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, I can go on and on and on. Those are all inflammatory diseases. So if you can do anything that's a natural anti-inflammatory, so you don't have to take a bunch of Motrin and ibuprofen and Aleve and, you know, all of those things, hey, have yourself some good green tea. It also contains, this is kind of neat, it's called L-theanine. And this is actually, um, it's, kind of, it's related to an amino acid. And this actually decreases the effect of the caffeine. So even though green tea might have higher amounts of caffeine, you're not really going to feel that effect like the shakiness or, oh, I can't sleep at night because of this L-theanine, which is kind of cool. Um, what else does green tea do? Well, there is some evidence to show that it could help with the breakdown of fat. And we always like that because all my patients are always dieting. So maybe breaking down some of that fat naturally and releasing norepinephrine, which is a hormone, a fight or flight um, hormone. Then of course, we've got herbal teas and there are so many different kinds and different combinations. And what's really neat is remember that herbal teas are made from herbs, from plants, either from the bark, the leaf, the stem, um, different parts of that plant. And they all have different um, health benefits related to whatever it is. Like I love chamomile tea. That definitely relaxes me, kind of like puts me in a sleepy state. So I really love chamomile. Um, but you know, peppermint is cool too, especially if I have a stomach ache or if I have constipation. Ginger tea, oh my gosh, that's like so good that if you've got nausea in the morning or even if you have arthritis pain, there's some studies to show that ginger is an anti-inflammatory. So making a tea out of that, oh, that's just a beautiful thing. You can make herbal teas out of different flowers like hibiscus and rose and, and all those different things. So it's really kind of fun, these herbal teas. They all have different types of flavors. So, you know, you might want to consider herbal teas. Now, the one thing you do have to um, think about, though, is on prescription medication and you want to drink an herbal tea, just check with your pharmacist. Because remember, when we're on medications, some medications have what we call food and beverage interactions. A good example would be, I have a lot of patients on cholesterol medications and the pharmacist always tell them, be careful of grapefruit. Don't eat grapefruit with your cholesterol medication because stuff in grapefruit actually will, you know, cause that work all that great. Um, I have patients that are taking Synthroid for their thyroid, and they shouldn't be taking vitamins with their Synthroid. So there are always interactions. So the best person to ask would be your pharmacist. So these are some of the pros and cons, you know, the pros broad range of flavors. Um, a lot of the herbal teas are caffeine free. So that's a benefit. And each one confers their own specific health benefits. Some of the cons might be, well, they are kind of expensive, right? Um, you might want to do maybe a do it yourself. You know, if you grow flowers in your backyard, just see if they're edible flowers. And maybe you can dry them in a dehydrator and then make your own tea out of it. That could kind of be fun. Again, just make sure you don't have any interactions with your medications and always be careful of the teas that say detox teas. Um, sometimes they'll put laxatives in them um, and maybe that was your intent and purpose, but be careful because you don't wanna become dehydrated and now you're ending up in the bathroom all day or maybe it's a problem with your medication. So always be careful with some of those detox teas. 
All right, so that was level two. So when my clients and patients say to me, I drink coffee, doesn't that count? And I'm gonna say, yes, it absolutely does, unless you're having a dessert coffee. <laughs> So level three, um, they categorize as low fat or skim milk and soy beverages. Um, and what's interesting is that there is controversy with milk. There are some people that just absolutely don't want to drink milk. And if that's your philosophy, then don't drink it. What's so nice is that we have a lot of non-dairy alternatives. But for those of us that don't mind drinking milk, milk could actually be a healthful food product or beverage. It has calcium, it has protein, it has vitamin D. Um, but if you don't want milk, then go to soy milk. Now, there is some controversy with soy milk as well. So if you have thyroid issues, or if you, you're a breast cancer survivor, or if you've had types of reproductive cancers, some of our oncologists are very conservative when it comes to soy. So always be careful with that. So soy and milk, both are good sources of protein. And as you can see, they didn't put almond milk, cashew milk, rice milk, they didn't include that in this category. And I think the reason why they didn't is because those um, beverages like almond milk, rice milk, et cetera, they don't have that much nutritional value in terms of protein. They don't have any protein, very little. They have carbohydrates a little bit and they have some calories. I think good choice, but according to the panel, it really didn't make it to level three. Um, that's why here nut milks were not included. Just remember, if you are a milk drinker, there are different categories that gets a little confusing. I have some clients that will say to me, I can't do skim milk, I'm doing 2%. Okay, well, what about 1%? <laughs> so you've got skim milk, 1%, 2%, and then you've got whole milk. I think I've even seen 4% as well. And the percent is just indicating how much fat is actually left in the product. So when you look at protein, that stays relatively the same. The percentage is indicating the fat content and, of course, the calorie content. So if you're looking at, say, skim milk, a cup of skim milk will give you about 90 calories, about 8 grams of protein, and no fat. Whereas if you went to whole milk, that would probably give you about 120 to 130 calories per cup. The protein stays the same, but then of course it's got eight grams of fat. So it all depends on what your goals are, you know, what your health status is. And I know that skim milk is really hard to take, especially when you like the thicker, creamier kind of beverage, but your taste will adjust. <laughs> they will. This is just a comparison that I just wanted to show you. I also stuck in the almond milk here just to give you that comparison. So calories, all right, milk is the most. So this is skim milk. And then soy milk was right behind it. Almond milk is lower. And if you buy the unsweetened one, it's even lower. It's got 30 calories. The protein, as you can see here, nice protein in soy milk and milk, but none in the almond milk. So again, if your goal is to increase your protein, you really can't get that from almond milk. Um, the fat is, you know, negligible here, depends on which milk you're getting. Um, this is interesting, though, if you're trying to reduce your sugar intake, milk is higher than soy milk and almond milk. And that makes sense, because milk contains lactose, which is the natural sugar found in milk. So again, if this is part of your goal, that you want to decrease your sugar or your carbohydrate intake, then soy or almond actually might be a better choice. And then when it comes to calcium, we know that dairy and milk are good sources of natural calcium. And soy is also a good source of calcium. Almond milk is fortified with calcium. So you can get calcium in all three products. All right, so that was level three. Now level four, we're getting to the category where, you know, it shouldn't be the first choice. So level four are the non-calorically sweetened beverage. In other words, those are the sugar-free diet beverages, whether it's diet soda or diet drinks like the Crystal Lights and things like that. Now these products are going to be using the artificial sweeteners, such as, you know, they're all different kinds, right? The yellow packet, the blue packet, the pink packet, um, the e equal, the saccharin, the sucralose. These are different types of artificial sweeteners. They're not created equal. So for example, this equal is actually a combination of two amino acids, which is pretty interesting. So those scientists figured out how to make those amino acids sweet. 
The problem with this is a lot of my neurologists don't want my patients that have migraine headaches to drink equal. It seems to trigger migraines in some people. Then you've got saccharin. Now saccharin is the pink packet. That's the sweet and low or the nectar sweet. And what was interesting about sweet and low is several years ago, I think I was still living in New York, um, sweet and low was actually banned for a while and it wasn't allowed to be beverages. Remember the beverage tab? <laughs> it was a soda called tab and it actually had sweet and low. And I remember it was pulled off the market for a while. There is some research to show that sweet and low actually um, cause cancer in lab animals and lab rats, stomach cancers and things like that. And the way the FDA kind of got around that is that they said that the dosage that one would have to eat would be so high that it would just be unrealistic for somebody to eat that much to confer a danger. So that's why Sweet and Low actually came back on the market. And then you've got sucralose, which is Splenda. And what's interesting about Splenda is they take um, sugar and they attach a chlorine to it. So they manipulate natural sugar and put, you know, something that you disinfect with <laughs> called chlorine. And there is some controversy about it. Um, what's interesting, even from an environmental standpoint, is I, you know, my husband's a contractor. So I talk to a lot of plumbers and subcontractors, and they say that um, these kind of products like Splenda actually do a lot of damage to the plumbing. And think about the water supply too. It's actually doing some weird stuff to the environment. I don't know. Um, and it's, it, you might be thinking, well, why is that? You actually pee this out. So you don't absorb sucralose or Splenda. So that's why you're not getting any calories from it. But where does it have to go? It actually leaves your body somehow. So you actually urinate the Splenda out. And it, it seems to be doing some weird things to your plumbing. <laughs> Just thought I'd tell you that. And then stevia, what's interesting about stevia is that it's not technically considered an artificial sweetener. It's actually considered an herbal um, because it does come from a plant. Um, don't let that be deceiving because just because it comes from a plant doesn't necessarily mean it's healthier. It just seems that it's less processed. It's not man-made in a, you know, in a lab somewhere. But it's interesting because there are some reports to show that stevia might have some adverse effects as well on your health, like cancer. And that's just interesting just because stevia is a product that's been used in the Asian countries for thousands of years. But it's also very interesting that the number one cancer of Japan is stomach cancer. So I'm not saying that stevia causes stomach cancer, but, you know, again, it's an artificial herbal sweetener, you know. So the pros of these kind of beverages is that they are calorie controlled. So we have to look at that goal as well. If you're trying to lose weight and you're trying to cut your calories, then it really does make sense to not drink your calories. So this might be a good option. Also, if you have diabetes, you're always, you know, a little bit conscious about drinking sugar. So this might be an option. But I think this is just contradictory to what I just said, because there are some research studies to show that some of these artificially sweetened beverages actually cause weight gain because it increases your craving for sweet foods and drinks. How weird is that? And when you look at some of the evidence, these sugar-free beverages really were hot on the market in the 1980s. And what's interesting is you see the trajectory of overweight and obesity right around that mark. So it seemed like those sugar-free beverages and sodas were going up in terms of sales, and so were our waistlines. And that didn't even seem to make sense, right? Because it was supposed to be cutting calories. It's kind of weird. The other thing that's interesting too is that there's some research to show that a lot of the free beverages actually change your microbiota. That's the good bacteria in your intestines. We're going to have a whole lecture on microbiota coming up. Um, but that's not good because if you're changing the natural bacteria in your intestines, you know, that's there for a reason. It actually confers health. So you're changing it a little bit which is interesting too. So that's why I think they put this at level four. You know, they don't want to take it totally off the market. They have to play politically correct as well. There are a lot of beverages com companies out there that you don't want to put them out of business, but we leave it up to the consumer to say, what are your education? 
you know, you it doesn't mean you can't have it, but maybe this isn't what you should be drinking mostly of every single day. And then, of course, last but not least would be level five. Actually, is there a level six? Oh, there is a level six. OK, so level five would be caloric beverages that have some nutrients. Now, look at this. Now, some people say to me, look, I drink juice. How is that bad? Well, according to this panel, it's level five. Uh, same thing with vegetable juice, same thing with whole milk. They actually put sports drinks here. They put the vitamin enhanced waters and they actually put alcohol here. And they say that although it may confer some benefits, it may be high in calories, which isn't good. It may be high in sugar. It may be high in fructose. And then, of course, alcohol, we can have a whole lecture on the adverse effects of alcohol. So that's why they put this on level five. So again, it can still be a choice, but it's lower on the scale. And always remember with alcohol that you know, we should still control how much alcohol we drink. So if you're enjoying your wine and you're a woman, good, you get five ounces. That's it. You're a man, you get 10 ounces. Um, if you're a woman and you like beer, you get one 12 ounce bottle. If you if you like your little gin and tonic, okay, you're a woman, you get 1.5 ounces. <laughs> so, you know, we still have to put some guidelines on alcohol as well. And now I can say last but not least, last but not least, the last level is level six. And these are the calorically sweetened beverages. And these are the least recommended because they're very, very high in sugar and fructose. And sometimes the artificial sugars like corn syrup, or, you know, which is not good for us. Um, some examples would be those fruit smoothies, those dessert coffees, those energy drinks. So, you know, when you think about the message, I have patients that'll say to me, look, I start the day off with a fruit smoothie, and they think they're doing themselves so Right? They're doing juice, they're putting fruit in it, they're putting some ice, maybe they put a protein powder in it and they get all excited. And here I am, Buzzkill Lil comes along and say, yes, but that's actually a level six. And the reason for that is that one drink can be hundreds of calories and lots of sugar. I think I did a lecture for you guys once where I compared one of the um, smoothies that my patient was actually creating and it had some ridiculous amount of sugar, like 50 grams or something ridiculous. So just remember that things that are calorically sweetened, you know, isn't all that great, not just because of the calories, but because we really should be lowering our sugar intake, especially high fructose corn syrup. We should get rid of that. So now this picture is going to make more sense to you. OK, so they said that water is level one. Level one is the best. This is what we should be drinking. So this is like the beverage meal plan. So they're saying at least half of your daily fluids should be water. So if you're drinking eight ounce, uh, you're supposed to have eight eight ounce glasses. Well, 50 percent of that has to be water. Then about a third of that, 33 percent can come from tea or coffee. So that's level two. 20% can come from milk or dairy alternative. And when you look at the guidelines, they say that we can have about two servings of dairy, right? Um, if you're going to drink juice, that's really restricted because that's, you know, that's level five and six. So only four ounces. And if you're doing fruit juice, it has to be 100% fruit juice. If you're doing alcoholic beverages, that's just make sure you follow the moderation. Ideally, no diet drinks made with artificial sweeteners. So again, they play politically correct here. So they said, ideally, no diet drinks made with the artificial sweeteners. But if you're going to drink them, just limit it to about 16 ounces per day. Okay, so two cans. Um, and then ideally, again, that word ideally, no drinks sweetened with sugar or high fructose corn syrup. But if you absolutely have to have that smoothie, then you get eight ounces. So what's nice about this is at least they put things in category, kind of gave us a guidance, you know, that say, hey, look, you know, we, we still have freedom to drink what we want, but we have to put the, the guard up there and, you know, drink the water, coffee and tea. Those are the top two. Okay. Now, if you're trying to keep track of your fluid intake, there are a bunch of um, apps, if you, especially if you like to play with your smartphone. Uh, a lot of this stuff is free, which is nice. You can download it for free. You get reminder buttons. I have lots of patients that will put on reminder buttons because they get busy and then all of a sudden their phone is ringing and they're like, what is that? Oh, I have to drink some water. And it really, really does help them. So you might want to check out some of these apps. 
So really a conclusion of this lecture is we got to prevent dehydration because it can definitely be deadly. It can hurt you, okay? Water is ideal, followed by tea and coffee, black preferably, but if you have to add just a little bit of milk, you can, maybe just a little bit of sugar, you can, it still counts. Um, apply daily strategies like your apps to keep you on track for sure. And these are the references, comes out of Harvard. And then of course, you know, I always end my presentations with my sons. All right, so what questions did you have? Did you kind of like that lecture? Did it kind of give you a new perspective about what we should be drinking or what we can drink and at least give you some options if you're not really a water drinker or maybe give you some options on how you can make water better? 